and go over this. Okay. All right. So um, the last three chapters in this book talk about uh, industrial luminaires. What do you need to specify when you're dealing with industrial luminaires? We have uh, so chapter 13, chapter 14 talk about the cost of lighting. When you design a cost, um, a lighting cost analysis, guys, um, what do you need to take into consideration? That's really cool. That's chapter 14. Chapter 15, uh, if you work for Target and you're selling cucumbers and potatoes and you want these cucumbers and potatoes to look fresh, what type of line do you specify that can deceive the eye to make the produce look fresh so people can buy more of them? It's really not really general lighting, it's specific lighting, targeting, produce to make things look um, look cool so people can buy more of them. Okay, so that's chapter 15. So if you guys, let's just focus a little bit on chapter uh, 13. That chapter 13 talks about industrial um, consideration and characteristics of industrial luminaries. When we move um, next um, next project, 45,000 square foot, it's going to have a manufacturing floor of close to, I would say, maybe, oh boy, uh, 17,000 square foot is going to be manufacturing floor for that building. That's industrial. So what type of fixture we need to specify in these industrial applications? Um, these are a few things that you have to, to take into consideration. So it talks about, um, the first thing that it talks about the cost, I'm coming to the cost in a second. So when you put an industrial uh, luminaire in a manufacturing floor, right now your options, you have three options in, 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 um, in an industrial. Option number one is high intensity discharge. Um, metal halide, typically metal halide. They're moving away, carry from this metal halide. When we go visit with Davis and Associates, they will show you the solution that take care of getting rid of all uh, metal halides and installing um, T5 fluorescent lights. T5 fluorescent lights are taking over the high, high pressure uh, um, um, sodium as well as metal halide fixtures. So your option will be high pressure sodium, metal halide, or fluorescent. You can have eight lamps of T5 or six lamps T5. Um, high outcome of lumens. You place them the same way we place uh, high intensity discharge, and that will take care of business. You guys have been at Rambo or um, or any of these places. Probably have seen these fixture fluorescent fixtures that has six lamps on them T5. They throw a lot of lumens at you. So fluorescent, high intensity discharge, and lately, lately guys also they have um, they have LEDs. Lately will be your LED stuff. So these are your fixtures of choice. As you choose your fixture, we'll talk about this one guys in a second. Three things need to be into in your mind as you pick a fixture for any application. You have to be thinking about three things. Number one is the initial cost. Uh, initial cost of fluorescent is half, almost half, or one third of LEDs. That's going to take into consideration, can the customer afford an, uh, an LED fixture? If they can afford it, it's the best uh, fixture they can, right now, the best fixture they can buy for any application. So, initial cost. The second thing is maintenance cost. Everybody knows what initial cost. How much you're going to pay for the fixture and the lamp that they, they want, right? That's easy. Is, is this fixture $80 or $200? That's your initial cost as you design your lighting system. The second cost is maintenance cost. How much would it cost you to maintain these fixtures? Now, we'll talk about this one later on. Maintenance, maintenance cost is maintaining the ballast, maintaining the louvers, the lens, cleaning the louvers, the lenses, maintaining the ballast and the lamps. All these, the, you need first material, right? If the ballast is burned, you're going to throw a new ballast there. Number the lamps, relamping, and you need somebody like so my friend Darren, journeyman electrician or maintenance electrician, um, to do change the ballast. Right, so you need to pay for the labor. So that's a big, big part of it. Operating cost is how much is it going to cost you to operate these pictures. These things, guys, will come to them again in chapter 14. You're going to see in a second, a little bit more details. I'll throw a couple of lights on them. There is a concept that called net present value. Anybody have taken? I don't think you have taken statistics, uh, statistics and accounting and all this stuff. Good stuff. They take a dollar today, Terry. And they say, what would that dollar equal in 1920? You guys know how they do that? Based on inflation. And so if I have, if your income is $50,000 today, 
What would that mean? Is uh, an income of a male in the 50s. So they think the, the, the dollar is value back or forward. Or for example, if your income is 50, uh, 20 years from now, what would be the in your income 20 years from now based on the inflation? So they move a value from the present to the future or to the past. <laughs> That's the statistics and accounting love these values. That's how they can predict how the economy is going to run and how things are going to go. Anyway, so they, this concept is net present value. <clears throat> They take the initial cost, cool, $20, maintenance cost, say this is going to maintain, I need to maintain it $20 per year, and operating cost is going to cost me to operate, say, $50 per year, and the projected, say, 20 years from now, what's going to, with inflation and all this good stuff, and they come up with an anti uh, net present value, and they say, here's the net present value for this fixture. And here's the net present value for this picture, and here's the net present value for this picture. And your job is to get the net present value the most. Does that make sense? So they take into consideration the initial cost, the maintenance cost, and operating cost over, say, 10, 15, 20 years, right? Because I don't, I can't predict what the cost of electricity is when it, they have to predict what the cost of electricity is going to go. There's factors that can predict that the electricity is going to go higher. So does that make sense, guys? The NPV. So every fixture will have an NPV when they do the cost analysis uh, on the fixtures, and based on this N NPV, you decide that fluorescent is my best option versus LEDs or high intensity discharge. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? About the NPV value, net present value, statistical value that can read the future basically for you. Because I know what the present is, I bought it for two hundred dollars, but I can't. I don't know what the maintenance is going to cost me because the labor keeps going up, right? And I don't know what the price, the kilowatt hour, is going to cost me because the electricity could go up. So they they put factors in it, factor it up, bring it, and have a value MPV that takes into consideration the future influences on all these values, especially the maintenance of operation. And based on this value, Zach, my friend, you decide which fixture is the best solution for you. Now, having said all this stuff, Kerry, I can tell you the net present value right now is the LEDs. You know that. I mean, if you do a net present value, you can find the LEDs as your is your best fixture. Done. Cool. Why would why would we do this one, guys? Anybody who said, Chad, what the heck are you doing? Guys who sell lights. They come to Dunwoody and they say, we're going to change every single fixture for you guys, LEDs. What's in it for us? The operating managers of Dunwoody, they will say, what's in it for us? It could be your company, your dad's company, they're coming to us and say, guys, we're going to revamp all your fixtures. What's in it for us? Then you have to come up with a net present value and a lighting analysis that says, oh, guys, this is the, this is why you should do it, because you're going to be saving this amount of money based on net present value for all your fixtures. You're going to be saving this amount of money over 20 years. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Any comments? Any questions about net present value? Take into consideration all these. Okay. When you install fluid in an industrial, there's two major things you have dam or wet location or dry location. Very, that's typical. I can't put a fixture, this fixture right above your head outdoor. Why? Because it's not rated for a wet location. So if you're in a wet location, your fixture has to be rated for wet or wet location, right? If you're in a dry location, your fixture has to be rated for dry location. Thumbs up, chair, typical for any fixture. Uh, hazard of location. When you're industrial, like we're going to do next project, Zach, uh, my friend, next project is going to have a class one, div one location. That's flammable gases. Flammable gases. When you put a picture like this in a flammable gas, class one, big one, guess what? Every time you turn the picture, that explosion. Right? You're going to get an explosion. So when you have a hazardous location, we'll talk about hazardous location later on, guys. There's class one, big one. That's flammable gases. Uh, class two, combustible dust. Ignitable fibers are class three. Flammable gases, combustible dust, ignitable fibers. And the words flammable, uh, combustible, ignitable, it has to do with the flash point of these materials. Flammable is the most, the least flash point temperature. You can burn a base at a lower temperature. So get it through for you guys, we'll talk about this on this project. So we have flammable gases, combustible dust, uh, ignitable fibers here. In the location, then 
this one gets to this one for each one of them that hasn't exist at all times. Cool? There are two that hasn't exist under abnormal condition. Abnormal condition. So, long story short, Adam, my friend, if you have a location that says class one, div one, location, what do you need to do? You need a fixture that says class one, div one, location. Then. That's it, explosion pool fixture. Explosion pool fixture. Dust type fixture. You can, for this one, you'll be for the pool, dust type, dust ignition pool for the, for the two, dust type for the three, so these are, so without getting into the hazardous location area, because we will be covering it in the industrial, because it fits in the industrial, be very aware in, in an industrial application, manufactured floor, you will be dealing with flammable gases, combustible dust, and ignitable fibers. And if the hazard exists at all times, that's division one. If hazard exists under abnormal condition, division two, your job and my job there is my friend is to size a fixture that can that says right on the name of it explosion proof i don't know if that one is that i usually have a, a picture inside that i show you guys when we do it that kind of the location but it has to have c1 d1 in it last one did one explosion proof can i have thumbs up chat we fully understand that if we are in the hands of this location flammable combustible the ignitable area uh, material uh, material in certain areas, we have to pay attention to the label on the picture. I cannot use, shall not, will not use the one above your head. With the hazard comes the group. The smarter than Chad, the, smart, the smarter than Chad guys decided that they, um, they group the gases and uh, the liquids, flammable gases and liquids and dust into uh, group A through D, I believe, if I have enough from our memory. A, B, C, D. Um, there's A, B, C, D is for class one. A, B, C, D, E, F, or E, G, I think. E, G is for the C1. So long story short, they take the groups and group A, we'll go over this one, guys, in the spring. Uh, group A is the most flammable gas, is group A. Cool. And then B less and C and D and then they go to the dust. Cool. So for the time to be in, your fixture not only has to say class one, div one, but also group A, B, C, or or, or or D. I don't know if they listed the group here too. I don't think they listed them in. Um, yeah, they don't have the groups listed here. Okay, but be aware. We'll go over this one, guys. Um, I'm going out of memory. I don't use them a lot to remember them. But there are groups. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? We understand that the picture has to have a label that's class one, give one, and a group on it. A group of the gas. Now, who group all these gases? The people specializing gas and, and flammable liquids and gases, right? Not me. I don't know what the, uh, this type of gas, what the flash point of this type of gas. When I know it's a group A, guys, I know it, then it's going to be a class one, div class one location. Div one has an exist at all times, div two under abnormal conditions. Any question guys about these? Groups are in there. The groups are in there? Okay. Group, thank you, thank you. Uh, so it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, yeah, D, and then E, F, and G. Thank you. A, B, C, D, these are for class one, the gases. And uh, F, uh, E, F, G, thank you. E, F, G, these are for the dust. These are for the dust. Thanks. So these are the groups. Any comments, guys, about the groups? The groups. A being the worst and uh, G being the least in terms of combustibility and flammability and ignitability. If I'm throwing all these uh, verbs at you, Zach, these are different. Flammable has um, a lower flash point than ignitable than combustible, meaning you can burn it at a lower temperature. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Okay. Any question then about these hazardous location and groups? Hazardous location and groups. So that's what you have to pay attention. First, the cause, then damper location and hazardous location. Um, okay, so that's basically what we do. Um, there's also nematite in page 111. They have um, the floodlights, guys. When you put the floodlights outside, now we're talking about streets and highways. 
you're putting big tower, 50, 100 foot, say uh, 60, 70 foot um, tower, and you're putting a big flood line to show the intersection between 494, say whatever it is, let's just say uh, 94 and 494, or, or 94 split um, into 494, and you will put a big flood light right there. You have to pay attention to the FAA and FCC, right? Because they have airplanes going, number one. So you have to pay attention. You probably know more than anyone about the FAA regulations. Um, you don't want to hit the, air, the, the choppers and all these things. You don't want to hit the tower, a big tower. So you have to have a beacon that you see these beacons, guys, at these big towers that um, that warns the pilots. Do not hit this big tower that has a light. They use them also on telecommunication antennas and, and tons of things. And FCC also, you don't want to interfere with the with the telecommunication, federal telecommunication. You don't want to interfere with, with other frequencies. There's regulations on the frequencies that you can put. So between FAA and FECC rules, you have to, they give you guys uh, a couple of, uh, for example, if you have a tower up to 150, you have two steady burning red obstruction lights at top of the, uh, of the um, obstruction. So in page 111, they give you Based on the height of the tower, how many beacon lights, red lights have to be, uh, have you have to put, number one, and at what height? So if you guys go to the last one, if your tower, if your tower up to 2,000 feet, now that's not for us. You wouldn't put a fixture. That's for telecommunication. Telecommunication towers. Then you have one flashing red 300 um, mm beacon at the top of the uh, 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 obstruction plus flashing red beacon and steady burning red obstruction light at alternative distances intervals approximately 150 feet apart. Okay, so these are not, they will tell you if you have a big high towers, typically guys, not for lights when you go at 2,000 feet, that's not light. Uh, these will be telecommunication. You have to warn the pilots. Um, or, or flying small airplanes or uh, choppers from the existence of these towers. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? I'm just going to, I'm going to stop at that one. So we have Federal Aviation uh, Administration and Federal Communication uh, Commission, I guess. These are the FAA and FCC rules. If you are at that high, if you go higher than, I would say if you go higher than 100 feet, picture, then you, you start having to pay attention to a lot of these regulations. If you are below 100 feet, uh, not a whole lot, which typically most of the stuff that we do is 100 feet or less, for lights. Any comments, guys, about this? Any comments, any questions about these little regulations? And the last thing that threw, guys, um, uh, for you here is emergency light. When you guys design an emergency light for your friend Chad, we said we have to maintain a foot candle of one uh, foot candle. Remember how the emergency light? We did not do the calculation, Aaron, for emergency light. Next project, I will uh, ask you, now that you guys know visual, I will ask you to, after I help you define the egress path in the building, I will set the egress path for you, and I said, I want you to use this type of picture and please run an emergency light. Exactly the same, guys except instead of running the calculation in the whole room, I will allocate this area here as uh, my egress, so your calculation zone will be just this area with one or two pictures here, and you have to do the calculation and maintain an average foot candle of one, one foot candle, or more. Can I have a thumbs up, Chad, about the emergency? So the same thing in an industrial plant, you need to have an emergency light, guys, um, and you have to maintain the one foot candle. Any comments, any questions about this chapter? That's what this chapter is in a nutshell, basically. Any comments, any questions? Really, the most important thing is the hazardous location area and the groove, and, as well as the NPV and the cost to take into consideration. Speaking of the cost, this chapter talks a little bit more about the cost, guys. So, any questions about this? If I don't, if you guys don't have any questions, I'm going to move directly into the next one because they're really tied directly to it. Um, oops. All right. Okay, chapter 14, guys, talks directly about the cost of lighting. The cost of lighting. Directly about the cost of lighting. Um, there's a few things I would like you to, it talks about and takes into consideration. 
If you look at the first, when you have cost of lighting, when you want to design a lighting system for a customer, you have to get to give them what's in it for them. Why should they use LEDs versus high intensity discharge, right? So when they come to you guys, now you know who's in the tourist for famous of doing this? Davis and Associates. Why? Because they will help you a lot with it because you want to sell their lights. So if you have a project like done when they decided to change all their lights, like I say. Uh, they will hire you guys to do to study a lighting study for them. Do a lighting study. What's in it for us going LEDs? What's in it for you is over the 20 years, you will see this amount of money. How do you do this? Here's what you need to take into consideration. Number one, initial cost, lighting cost, operation cost, payment cost. These are the three major costs that are going to be encountered. Now, the initial cost, as you do your analysis, everybody knows what initial cost. 200 $200 fixture versus $80 fixture. That's your initial cost. That only accounts for 5 to 10 percent of your overall cost of the fixture. Be aware of that. So why do they, why it's important? Because when you come to a customer and you say, here's a fixture $80 and here's a fixture $200, what do you think most of the customers are going to go? To the $80. Cheaper, right? You don't approach the customers with this. You don't tell them $80 and $20. You work with them with the next present value based on all this analysis. You tell them, here's what this fixture is going to save you over 20 years. That's how they sell the fixtures, basically. So, based on so five, only 5 to 10 percent so of your overall cost over, say, 20 years of that, that uh, building, 5 to 10 percent of your, um, your initial cost. Operating cost, operating cost, my friend, is 40 to 50 plus maintenance cost is 30 to 40. So between the operating, the whole idea, guys, and these are numbers you can vary, between <coughs> operating the fixture, between operating the fixture, between these two, operating and maintaining the fixture, you're sitting at 80 to 90% of your overall cost over the life of the fixture, which is 10 to 20 years. Cool? Who cares? When you approach Jeff, when you become a project manager and you want to solicit business for your company, right, which you guys are, I hope you will, and you will be one day, you will approach somebody to get that project for your company because it's good for them, good for the environment, and good for everybody, and good for the company, right? That's how you're going to approach them. You're going to approach them that with the cost analysis. Your cost analysis including the net present value of the cost of this, you're going to take into consideration that 200 fixture, dollar fixture versus 80 is only 5% of your overall cost of that fixture over the life of the fixture. So we're going to pay attention to, you pay attention to the 80 to 90%. That's why, guys, a lot of institutions, University of Minnesota, Mayor Clinic, these big institutions that have tons and tons of lighting fixture, campuses, they go and they run analysis of their lighting system. Lighting system accommodate for 30% of your consumption of power. Consumption in the building, 30% of your consumption of power is lights. Now, if I can cut that 30% by half, make it 15%, do you think I'm going to save money overall for the institution? And we're not talking about your basement or my basement or little house. We're talking about an institution that owns multiple buildings, right? Multiple thousands and thousands square foot buildings. It makes a lot of sense. So, when you approach it, my friend, the initial cost five to 10, the overall cost is the operating cost of the maintenance. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? We fully understand how to approach that. Cool. So that's your operating cost. That's why Excel is giving incentives for companies. And if you go to the website right now, we'll do it in the spring. They're giving incentives for you to change to LEDs or high efficiency fluorescent lights. And they will say, if you do it, we're going to cut your consumption of energy by this amount. Because for them, it saves them a lot of money on building power plants and distribution lines and transmission lines. Okay, can I have thumbs up, Chad? We know the initial cost, operating cost, maintenance cost. <coughs> thumbs up, cool. Operating cost, maintenance, uh, initial, the first day, the, the amount of money that you pay for the fixture. Operating cost, that's the kilowatt hour that you pay over the life of the fixture. And then the maintenance cost is how, long, how much money you're going to pay Jeff to go uh, change the ballast, relamp all these fixtures at Dunwoody, change the ballast for all these fixtures, right? And either him or one of his apprentices will go there and clean the 
reflectors, the louvers, and the lenses, so the picture can be efficient. Do you guys remember when we talked about lumen and we said um, lumen depreciation factor and dirt depreciation factor? These are will come into your lumens. If you have a good maintenance, you can get more lumen out of your picture if you have a good maintenance um, practices, right? Any comments, guys, about the maintenance? The initial cost, operating cost, the maintenance cost, I am the percentage of the overall cost of the project. No? So that's, um, when it comes to maintenance, we have lamp, lumen depreciation factor, lumen dirt depreciation factor, room surface dirt depreciation factor. So how often do you change the lamps? How often do you relamp? Do you relamp every three years or every 10 years or never? We keep, you keep burning that fixture until it burns. Um, probably Darren, you might appreciate that one. There is a, 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 a book I'll order. I'll bring it to you guys. You look at it. It's called uh, LMBA has a book. It's called 70 B, not E. 70 E. You're looking at it right here. 70 B. It's the maintenance procedure for commercial and industrial buildings. How do you maintain electrically maintain electrically maintain a commercial and industrial building? And it tells you how often you relamp your fixtures, how often you torque your lungs. So it's really cool. So when I get that book, I'll show you guys when everyone look at it. I order it. So maintenance is a big deal. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? Maintaining the fixture good. Okay, now. So do you and I agree that 80% to 90% of the overall cost of the fixture is going to be dollars from operating and maintaining the fixture. Because of that, because of that. The only thing I can play with is the operating cost of reduction. I can only reduce my cost, initial cost that's set by the manufacturer. Eric, if I tell you the picture that you made, you set the, the price for this picture based on the market at $100. I might be able to get discount from you, but that's about it for the initial cost, right? If I'm a good customer, I might you might say, Chad, you just bought uh, 20,000 fixtures from us over the, the life of the year, I'm going to give you 10% discount. And ask for a discount. They give you a discount. If you have the volume, or not economy here, but if you have the economy of volume, if you have a volume, they give you a discount. OK, so I can pay on the volume here, but that's not a whole lot. The only thing I can do substantially reduce by cutting by half almost is my operating and maintenance cost. Operating cost reduction. When to reduce your operating cost, electronic ballasts are must. To meet the energy code now, guys, you cannot meet the energy code without electronic ballast done. So the first thing is these electromagnetic ballasts that hum and consume a lot of power and this efficient, you cannot, by code, you can't do it with them if you want them. Electronic ballast. Second, high efficiency fixture and lamps. Fixture and lamps. High efficiency fixture, guys, the design of the fixture throw more light to the location that you want or or absorb more light or stray, make the light stray to other locations. So your picture has to be designed for the application. Look at this picture here. You can see it's, it's scaled like this, so it shoots the, the light downward where it should be. So you need to buy electrical high efficiency fixture that you have no control over it as a manufacturer and then that will put you in what? In LED. The most high efficiency lamp right now is LED. And the most high efficiency fixture, one of the visible application, two by four is very efficient in shooting the light where it should be right on top of Kiri's head, where we want it to be, right? So can I have thumbs up, Chad? High efficiency fixtures and lamps are the most important things that you can do to reduce your operating cost. Um, lighting control, then instead of burning the, if you just look at the back row behind you here, nobody's sitting in the back row. Um, well, we could have turned these lights off, but they don't want to depend on Chad's mood, mood that day, turning it on and off. They want you to have some type of electronic means of controlling it. Occupant the sensor, do you, does that sound familiar to you guys? Hot sensor, uh, low voltage, dimming, daylight harvesting. That that fixture right next to Aaron, there's a window there. It's not like it's making a big difference, but see if the whole wall here is windows. And that row that you can see, I can control it. If the sun is coming, why should that row of light be on? So they have a sensor outside that says if a certain amount of lumen is coming in, remember David and Associate guys were talking about that one, I can dim or tear off the whole room. Now, uh, a room like the room that we're in is not a big deal, guys. You go into, um, 
Uh, Best Buy headquarter. Uh, anybody have been Best Buy headquarter in Bloomington, Richfield? That's Richfield. 494 and 35W in that area. If you go there and you see the windows, all the windows are, um, they have windows all over. So you need to utilize the natural light in leaving your building to consume, to, uh, to reduce your consumption of energy. So long story short, this becomes a big, big deal. Light harvesting becomes a big deal. Anyway, so to cut your operating cost, these are the three measures that you have. Electronic bell, fire protection fixtures, LM, and lighting control. Some means of auto lighting control system. Do we have thumbs up, Chad? We understand that one. Um, now, with all this, with all this, this will come into your operating cost. Now, maintenance cost. Maintenance cost. To cut on your maintenance cost, guys, do not try to make a fixture easy. Uh, Jeff, you can talk about this one in there. When you when you open and change the balance on that one, make it easier for the electricians to open it. That's manufacturers, number one. Number two, don't mount them at 50 foot. Maintaining a fixture that's mounted at 50 foot, if I can mount it at 25, should I mount it at 50 if I can mount it at 25? No, why? Because maintaining a fixture that's mounted at 50 feet, guys, it takes what? It takes a lot, a lot of money. You know, you can't put a ladder, you have to have a left that takes you all the way up. So in when the design process is taken into consideration maintaining these fixtures, maintaining these fixtures, the height of the fixture, typically 12 feet to 25 feet, that's the ideal height depending on the application. You go higher than that, you, you, you need more means of maintenance. Maintenance will cost you more. So you can also, by designing the location of the fixture, you can cut on the maintenance, maintenance part. Um, Another factor of maintenance, guys, if you have louvers, cleaning the louvers is a pain in the butt, right? These louvers, little louvers, versus lenses. Lenses is easier to clean than louvers. So by design, certain fixtures can get you less maintenance on it than other fixtures. Any comments, guys, about the, the reduction on this value? So really, the, the, the big chunk of money that you could save is from the operating cost. Um, and another big chunk of money is maintenance cost by designing your fixture and placing it in a location where it's easy to maintain. Easy to maintain. Any comments, any questions about that? Comments, questions? So that's what I wanted to, to talk about. Um, safety is not here, guys, but uh, the smarter than chat, any sequel concern about safety, this fixture right above your head to maintain them right and not kill the electrician, because it doesn't matter, you can maintain it good and you kill the electrician, it costs you an arm and leg, plus, of course, the moral value of killing people, right? If you don't worry about the moral value, it will cost you an arm and leg if you kill one of your maintenance guys fixing it. So now, all these fixtures come with, we talked about this one, a disconnect, where you can load interrupter, you can push it and open it, so you can need to clean that fixture, Really good louvers, lenses, reflectors, change the balance, change the lens completely. So that's part of your, um, it could be part of your maintenance tool. Okay, the last thing that I have a few things about retrofit for you. Um, they're talking about uh, consideration should be given to incandescent fluorescent uh, with magnetic. So they're telling you, um, if you walk into a place like Dunwich, how can you make the, the energy, um, the lighting system efficient? Well, I can tell you, a couple of things. Number one, have if you can instead of we don't have T12, we have T8 right now. All these are T8 on electronic ballast. T8 electronic ballast are fixtures. One major thing for these ones is probably cleaning, cleaning the fixtures. Cleaning the fixture give you more more ballast. But say if you walk into a place and they're using incandescent lamps, I don't think you'll find any place commercial industrial that are using this. Um, good application, Jeff. You walk into a place they have high intensity discharge. That's a, that's all over. You can walk in there and say, here's a solution for you. What's your solution, Jeff? I, you guys can use T5, um, high uh, output T5 fixtures that can so solve the problem of uh, more efficient, uh, consume more, less energy, give you the same amount of light. So that will be a solution for retrofit. And uh, it fits in the same location, so you don't have to rewire. Take this fixture in your rainbow and put the new fixture right in, in the same location. So that could be a, a consideration. Otherwise, uh, T12, no longer you can use them. Everybody knows that T12 fat ones, except the women. Uh, you can use T5 or T8 for them, electronic ballast. Um, 
uh, clean the luminaires. So they have a whole list in page 115, guys. I'm not going to go over all of them. Please read them. Um, these are things that you can make uh, lighting retrofit, what to change um, from and to, so to make your lighting energy system efficient, lighting energy system efficient. Um, any comments, any questions, guys? Any comments, any questions? Really, the, the best thing to do when we do retrofit, there's a lot of companies, uh, who am I going to pick? Adam, my friend, when you go work, I know for a couple of years you might not be the decision maker, but one time you will be a decision maker. You walk into a company and say, I can save you 20% of your power consumption if you hire us to do a lighting study for you guys, and we will partner up with Amazon Associates or any other entities, and we will get you the most efficient lighting system. That's basically what, what this calculation is all about. Any comments, any questions as well, retrofitting lights? A lot of companies are retrofitting lights. Right now, my understanding is, uh, Jamie, is you can retrofit the same fixture. You don't have the frame stays the same. You can put an LED fixture right into that one. Take the guts, cut out this fixture, and you put LED right into it. What's important about when you come to us at Dunwood is say, that's how we can do it. I don't have to hire an efficient to rewire the whole building. You can disconnect the, the whole area, just Got out the whole guts of uh, the ballars, the reflectors, and inside it with new, new housing, and you're good to go. The housing stay the same, put the new reflectors and new LEDs and new lenses, and you're uh, uh, up and, and going. You do not have to rewire. So, all these are solutions. Um, when we go to Dems and Associates in the spring, guys, you will, you will hear them talking a lot about retrofits and so forth. Okay, any comments, any questions about the cost of light? Really, the most important thing is these values that we taught you, give or take, and how do you reduce your consumption of energy in lights? Jeff, my friend, make sense? No? Yes? Okay. Okay, so that's the last thing I wanted to, I want to go over, guys, before I let you go. One more slide. If you go to... Um, Display light, chapter 15. All these are one, two pages. I hope you understand. They're not like, uh, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't cover them all together. The last chapter talks about display light. Now, display light is a special light. These are not, everything that I talked to before was general lighting. Everybody knows about the difference between general light versus specific light. General lights to lift the area that people are going to work on. Specific lights is task lights. Uh, throw light on a picture on a wall, right? Or throw light on the cucumbers, uh, uh, rainbow so you can buy it. Display light, guys, is to display, uh, produce, and uh, merchandise so people can can uh, can buy it. These are task lights, not the general lights. So when you walk guys into when you walk into any store, you have first the general light that you can see, and a lot of stores have also specific lights. Right, task lights right where the merchandise are located. They're throwing more light at the merchandise so that we can make you and I, typically my wife and your wife, to buy more of this stuff, right? So that's that display light, the most important thing about this display light. Okay, in order for FYI, we don't, I don't know, I've never done a display light, though we have done a lot of general lighting, but display light is kind of a specialty. Um, but they will be, you will be asked. Uh, target stores, that would be a good exam uh, question for, uh, you know, who, um, Chef Puri, because they do a lot of target stores, and target stores do a lot of products, they sell a lot of things. It would be nice to see how they handle the, the task lights for all these, uh, uh, or display lights for all these uh, merchandise. Anyway, in order to make things stand out, if you want Chad to stand out, right, the first thing you have to make, to make the light on anybody to stand out three to five hundred more than the surrounding. Does that sound familiar, Adam? When you see your uh, your um, your favorite singer, who's your favorite singer? Do you have one? Johnny Cash. How about uh, Andrew? Johnny Cash is good for you and I. Who's going to Johnny Cash? No, anybody disagree here? No, nobody like Johnny Cash. Okay. When Johnny Cash or somebody or uh, any other of your singers, when they're singing, yes, remember that, what do they do? They put the lights right on top of them, especially these pop stars jumping around. Why do you think they put the light and everything is dark? 
they make them stand out. That's what this means. That's exactly what this is. They was all the light that God created right at the top of them. So you can see them from a distance and enjoy them if they're your singer. Or if it's a cucumber, Chad will love it. I love cucumbers, right? Shine the light there. So it makes things stand out. So make things stand out. You would have to throw 300 to 500 more lights than the surrounding, right? If I'm the pop, pop star right now, you're going to put three. So if the lumens in this room, right, 80, 80 times uh, uh, five is what? Four, four, 400? 400 lumens right at me to make me stand out in this environment. Does that make sense? So anyway, these are rules of thumb. So when you, if you ever done a display light, keep this in mind. You have the thing that you're going to display, you're going to throw more light at it. Close to 5% five, five, uh, more. Any comments, guys? So that's the concept of light. The second concept that they use, guys, they use low voltage incandescent and metal headlights. Believe it or not, a low incandescent lamps are bad. Inc incandescent is bad work, right? We hate using incandescent lamps. For general lighting, bad word, not efficient. <clears throat> for display, for display, they're used with metal halide, either one of them, because they can give you a special metal, uh, like this, give you the true color of the object, the true color of the object. So anyway, but look at that. These are low voltage, so they're running at 24 volt. Efficient because they run them at 24 volt. These are not 150 watts that they use for display. They use 24 volt, and they put them in a certain location, guys in the cabinet <coughs> to shine at the object. Uh, low voltage you get into light, metal headlight. So these are the ones that they do. And um, so what they do is they, if you guys look at page 119, they have all these track lights, a lot of track lights, and they throw a track light right at the object so it makes it stand out. Because in order to make me stand out, you can't use this fixture. There's no way you can put 500, 500% more lumens using this fixture. You have to have a special fixture that shine and direct the, the light, direct the light to the top of uh, me, right? To make me stand out. So they use uh, track lights and display lights, different type of display lights. Um, the only thing, so, and, um, so these are the types of fixtures that he uses. Something called color fading. After a while, the metal halide, the low, uh, uh, metal halide, the color fade on them, guys. So you have to be careful with the color fading. So they use them a lot, metal halide, guys, in the cucumber areas. I'm not kidding you. On the produce, you see there some lights. They shine them. They make the produce look more fresh. So this is a way of deceiving your eye to make it look fresh so you can buy it. Um, apples and, and all this, stuff, especially the produce. So that's one application for them. Color fading, like I said, um, uh, metal halide will fade, so you have to pay attention to changing the lens because of the color fading that can happen to, um, to the equipment. And the other thing that you have to, related to the color fading, guys, if you throw a light, the, concept, the United States Constitution, Right? You guys have seen the way they display the original copy of the Constitution. When you want to put some light there, do you think any light can be put there to display that, that document? They have to use a special light that cannot degrade the document. So I know that we're getting way too much into areas that specialize areas. But be aware that when you display, if I am degrading the color of the cucumber is one thing. If I am degrading the color of the Constitution of the United States, the first document, that's a completely different thing. Does that make sense? Or Mona Lisa on the wall, and I'm shining a light in it. Do you think that light, over time, is going to kill the material, degrade the material? Absolutely. So long so short, what they do is they use a lot of LEDs, a lot of special lights um, to filter um, all the waves that can eat into the material and degrade the material. So this is beyond really our our scope of study here. But just be aware of the degrading effect of this play light. The last thing I'm going to show you guys, they have a picture of how do they use the display. Since the object of this play light is to make make what you want to display stand out. So what they use, they beam. They beam these lights. I don't know if you guys can see that here. They beam these lights. If you look at the first one, they're using tungsten halogen reflect uh, 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 reflect uh, rise the lens with a reflector 
Can you see, um, they have a couple of, if you do me a favor, just look at the first one, LAM performance data, LAM. They have the Q45 PAR 38-FL, that's a type of picture that they use. Then, rated lumens, uh, rated light is 2,000 hours. Um, beam spread, here's how they do them, Jeff. They do a spread of a beam, uh, 28 to 28. So it doesn't flip anything, 28. We're gonna focus it right on this for you. So we have a beam 28 by 28 degree. Uh, distance, then they give you the distance, zero M angle, so they have a distance four. You need initial foot candle at the beam, 113, beam length three, beam width three, and maximum spacing for even illumination is three. So long story short, guys, based on the beam, without getting into all these details, based on the beam and the distance, how far you have to put the light from the merchandise, um, you, uh, it gives you the layout of these pictures, the layout of these pictures. So if you look at the first one, if you don't mind, if I put my picture, Jeff, three feet away from the object, okay, so here's the object to the wall, three feet away from the object, and then I have initial foot candle at the beam is 113, that's from that picture, then the beam length is going to be three, the beam width is three, and uh, maximum spacing for even illumination is three. If I put it four from the wall, guys, with this particular like beam, then I place them at three feet, one more picture, another three feet, one more picture. So based on the beam, they give you the layout of your pictures. Again, FYI only, I mean, you know, display light is a whole different arena, guys. Just be aware that you might, uh, Joe, my friend, when you become a, light, a certified lighting designer, that's when you start paying a lot of attention to that object, a lot of attention. Now with the software that we have, guys, remember I think, Jenny, you were doing the beam and uh, adjusting the beam for these pictures. You can tilt the picture. That tilting of the picture, you basically adjust the beam, you know. Uh, you have to, first you have to have a picture that you can tell. I can't tell this picture even if I want to, that right above your head. So you have to have a picture um, that you can tell the lamp in, number one, special picture for this thing. Second, me, second, you can adjust this picture within a certain amount of radius in, in almost any direction, within a certain amount of um, um, angle, you know, limited angle. Anyway, so if you guys look at that one, the other one on the right side is tungsten halogen. I will look at the first one. They can, uh, one picture is Q20, MR16. I don't know if they're even still these in the market, but uh, rated like 3000. It gives you a beam spread seven by five, bigger beam, bigger beam spread, right? And um, and based on the distance, if I put them seven feet from the object, they can give me 183 lumens, and the beam is one, uh, beam length and width is given, as well as the maximum spacing of these. Maximum spacing for even illumination is one foot away from each other. Any comments, any questions? Any comments, any questions? So please look at these, FYI only. We really don't, we don't do a whole lot of display light. But I thought uh, the last thing to finish with display light, special lights. Any comments, any questions for your friend Chad? Cool. So with this, guys, we wrap our lighting component of this uh, semester. So I hope it was uh, uh, not as painful as, uh, as you thought it would be. So the whole chapter, guys, we talked about the nature of the light, if you remember. And then we did a lot of lighting calculation, horizontal and vertical, the average method, the point-to-point -point method. And then we moved into the fixtures and the construction of fixtures and lamps and so forth. And then we end up with lighting studies, you know, based on the, uh, the values. The chapter we didn't talk about the values, cost of light, and then how to produce a lighting system. Remember how Jeff we did visual, like you would have software, how we start to import into visual and you do the calculation and then you do all these reports and so forth. And the last thing we did, as you can see, is display light. Display light, which is kind of the least in our agenda today. Any comments, any questions? With this, my friend, you will wrap your lighting component with your friend Chad moving forward next uh, semester. You're not going to hear Chad talk about lighting again other than visual. So we grab visual and run with it. Okay. So these are the information that we give you guys. It's, I think it's very valuable. If you want to branch into this area and you become a certified lighting designer, it's unreal.
uh, you will repeat everything that I did in one way or another by hand, because that's how they certify it. Who cares about certified lighting designer? Job security, number one, and more money. Because as designers, uh, uh, Adam, my friend, you cannot be like myself, registered engineer. You have to go to the museum. So if you don't want to be a registered engineer, you want to have an, something. Um, the more the more things you have on your resume, the better you are. Okay? Thank you. Here's our speaker. And you guys have uh, a few minutes to spare. Do we have a break there before we start? Thank you. Just warm them up again.